If you've happened across some of my recent project videos, you'll know I've been trying to make a compact water monitor using a Raspberry Pi Pico. And at last, with the addition of solar power, I've got a self-contained unit, which programmed with deep sleep to conserve energy between readings, should go on just about indefinitely. And in this video, I'll take you through how I made it, implementing all the learning from the very basic prototype and the slightly more sophisticated version too, with its little plastic box and battery power. You can see that build video in the link above, but stick with us here because we'll be covering some of the same ground, but with lots of improvements. The most obvious being the addition of solar panels. Once again, the housing is provided by the little plastic box, and I'll be using a similar 500 milliamp hour LiPo battery. But instead of the Pimeroni LiPo shim, I've got a multi-source charger from Adafruit, which along with the USB will manage the input from the solar panels. I'm also switching out the original Pico for a wireless version, the Pico W, as eventually I want it to alert me remotely when the plants need watering, rather than relying on the flashing LED. But that's for a future video. But I will be switching from the red LED to the onboard green one, which means I can dispense with the circuit board, directly soldering a header onto the Pico for the sensor cables. And with all my new bits assembled, I can get on with the job. For the code, I'm using the program I ended up with on Water Monitor 2.0. So first of all, I need to access that from the old version. Plugging in the USB to my host computer and opening the file through Thony, finding it in the left-hand pane. It's the one called main.py, which runs automatically as soon as the Pico is plugged in. And I want to save that down to the host computer, finding it somewhere sensible. Now that's the MicroPython program that includes the deep sleep, which with a couple of tweaks I'll be using for this project. It will be shown in some detail later on, but if you want to know the background behind it, you can click the video link above. And when copied over, I can exit Thony and disconnect the Pico, ready to set up the new one. Now this is quite a well-documented process, and there are some other great videos out there, but I thought I'd include it in this one anyway, as out of context it can seem quite opaque. In fact, it's very straightforward. Just hold down that boot cell button with your thumb while you plug in the USB cable. Now you do have to wait a little bit longer than I'm showing here, but eventually a device icon appears on the screen and up pops a dialog box and you can just click the OK button. What you see then is slightly confusing, but it really is all you need to get set up. You can ignore the text file, but click on the other one and it will take you to the Raspberry Pi site, where you can scroll down to the MicroPython link. Here you'll find everything you need, along with an excellent installation guide, telling us the first thing to do is to download MicroPython for our particular Pico. Although going this route will change the sequence of things a little. And actually, we've already completed stage 2, and stage 3 just shows the files we've already seen. Now stage 4 is the bit we really need to look at, which is how to install the download onto the Pico itself. Then freshly familiar with the instructions, we can scroll down the short distance to the download link, making sure we get the right one for the Pico W. The download itself is pretty quick, and we can go off to the downloads folder to find our file. And just as our instructions set, drag and drop it onto the RPI RP2, where it will copy over. Now I'm not sure why it has unstable in the file name, but apparently it's nothing to worry about. And installation is now complete. And we can unplug the USB and plug it back in again. This time without the boot cell button pressed. And we can access the Pico through Thony. Now we need to get that program that we copied from Water Monitor version 2.0 onto our freshly set up Pico W. And I've already opened it from the documents folder where we saved it on our host computer. Then doing a save as gives us the option of putting it on the Pico where we can name it main.py so it runs automatically when the Pico is powered up or in our case when it wakes from deep sleep and you can see it in that pane on the left hand side. Now for a few tweaks and obviously while we're working on the project we don't want it to be sleeping quite that long so I've changed that 5 hours 59 minutes to just 60 seconds. Next up is adjusting the code for the alarm LED and there are two changes we need to make here. Unlike the standard Pico, the W doesn't use pin 25, and we just need to type in LED in inverted commas, instead of 25, in that line of code. And as we're using the green LED as our alarm, rather than a separate red one, I just need to switch out red for green in the bit that flashes the LED, and I can remove the previous instruction for the green one, and delete red altogether, and then save the code. I've inadvertently left a line turning the green LED off just before deep sleep, which is a bit untidy, but actually has no effect. 
I'll strip that out later. And for now, we can exit Thonny and disconnect our Pico, ready for the hardware upgrade, which starts with the angled header for the sensor cables. In the previous version, the Pico had a full set of headers, soldered through to a circuit board, with the header for the sensor soldered to the strips, along with the red LED. But as we're no longer using that, or the Pimeroni LiPo shim, we can dispense with the headers and the whole circuit board altogether, and just use the relevant pinouts for our little angled header. Now let me take you through the wiring and explain which pins we're using and why. The three physically adjacent pins are 31 to 33, 32 and 33 providing the power to the sensor. Although as far as the Pico is concerned, 32 is actually GP27 and we've got that program to turn on immediately after deep sleep. The signal from the sensor goes to one of the analog digital converter pins, ADC0. Next up is the power to the Pico itself. The two wires from the Adafruit charger, which I'll be soldering directly to the Pico, red to VSYS and black to the ground next door. Another thing I want to try in the future is a capacitive sensor, and I just want to make sure that that's catered for in the position of my header. But that's for a future video, and for now, I'm just using the three pins, with two left over spare. And with the position established, I can get on and solder all five of the pins. Now for the power supply, and I'm using this multi-input charger from Adafruit, which has sockets for USB-C and for our solar panel, and then two JST connectors, one for the battery and an output for our Pico. And it's the wires from this that I'm soldering to the ground and the VSYS pins, numbers 38 and 39 from our diagram, just starting with a bed of solder on the pins themselves before melting down the tinned ends of the wires. Now this direct connection to the charger is fine while I'm running the program, but I will need to unsolder it when it comes to changing the code at all to avoid duplicating the power supply from both the USB and from the battery. I'll come to my more permanent solution later on, but for now, with the wires soldered in place, I can plug my battery into the other JST socket, and with that little bit of charge already on the battery, my Pico leaps into life, automatically running our main.py program, which flashes our alarm LED as we don't have a sensor plugged in. Now I want to get that battery fully charged, so I'm plugging in my USB-C cable, and the LEDs on the Adafruit charger show us that that's working perfectly. The red one should go out when we're fully charged. And now, let's plug in our sensor. The three pins of the cable just plugging into our newly soldered header, and the red LED shows us our sensor is getting power, because we're currently in the wake cycle of the program. Now with everything plugged in and our program running, let's put it to the test. And with our sensor submerged in some water, we can wait for the end of its sleep cycle, when it will power up and measure the voltage between the two prongs, which is sufficient to not activate our flashing green LED. But we'll have to wait until after the deep sleep cycle to test again. For the final bit of electrics, we come to the solar panels, which is completely new to me, so will require quite a lot of trial and error. But what I do know is I need to turn the bare ends of the cables into something I can plug into the Adafruit socket. And I've got a specially purchased cable with a barrel connector at one end and bare cables at the other, just for this purpose. It's pretty long and I'm not sure how much I'm going to use. So for initial trials, I'm just doing a rough and ready solder job to join the cables. Not very pretty, but it will do for now. The first result of testing is to show that I've got some of my sums wrong. The panels are 3 volt, which I thought would be enough to power my Pico, but I should have read the spec for the Adafruit charger more carefully, as that requires 6. But a quick consultation with my GCSE science student sons confirms that wiring the solar panels in series will double the voltage, although the current will stay the same. And a second panel should do the trick, which fortunately I'd ordered in for just such an eventuality and I've added that into my circuit. Then for testing, I've just sellotaped the two panels onto the kitchen window, one next door to the other, with the wires trailing inelegantly below. The other end of the cable is a bit more professional, and we can plug the barrel connector into the Adafruit socket. Now it's a bit of a dull day, so I'm not getting enough current to register on the little red LED on the charger, but leaping ahead to the finished item, this is what I can expect on a sunny one, with the solar panels running my Pico, and hopefully recharging my battery as well. Now we come to the packaging, and I'm using the same little plastic box that I got from Amazon for my previous version. And even though the components have changed slightly, they still fit, stacking nicely one on top of the other. The Adafruit charger right at the bottom, followed by the LiPo battery and the Pico at the top, where it will be attached to the inside of the lid, with a cutaway for the sensor cables. 
I'll also need some holes for the various sockets on the Adafruit charger. And with the charger held in place, I'm marking out the corners of a rectangle where the barrel connector will poke through. My method is to gradually enlarge the hole, testing the position against the component as I go, to get an accurate snug fit, so my markings don't need to be that precise. But I will need a nice new sharp blade for my scalpel, as even though the plastic of the box is quite soft, I'll need to be precise for the finishing touches. Before drilling for the top two corners, I'm going to need to slice away a little bit of that lip, gradually reducing the height until it's flush with the rest of the box, and then I can use my hobby drill to drill the corners, just inside the markings that I made with the Sharpie pen. It's a bit rough and ready at the moment, but I'll be refining the position and squaring them up with the blade at the end. For my first incisions with the knife, I'm cutting well inside my rough markings, using a rocking motion and keeping a little bit of pressure down on the blade, first on the left hand side, and then the same on the right, until I've cut through all the way from one hole to the other. Then I can do the same thing along the bottom. The top presents a bit more of a challenge, as I've only got a narrow strip of plastic above the aperture, so I'm using a slightly different method, moving the hobby drill bit sideways, cutting through the plastic as it goes, until the central rectangle just falls out, leaving us with a crude aperture, which we can check against the charger itself, before going on to tidy up the edges. Now it's important to take your time on this, gradually removing the plastic, straightening up the edges bit by bit, as I want to end up with a really snug fit. But you don't want to watch all the way through a slightly laborious process. So I've edited out quite a big chunk here, including the many checks against the charger for position. And with the finishing touches on the corners, I can fit the barrel socket through the hole. With that in place, I can mark up exactly where the slot for the USB connector needs to go which I'm going to do in exactly the same way. First drilling the ends of the slot, then slicing out the plastic on either side, first crudely removing the middle, and then as before, gradually enlarging the slot and refining the edges until we've got the perfect shape for a USB-C cable to plug into the socket. With the holes on the charger sorted, I can turn my attention to the Pico and that slot for the sensor cable. That angled header actually falls in quite an awkward position. If I have the box opening to the left, it would interfere with the clip of the lid, so I don't really have any other option than to do it on the hinge side, with the box opening to the right. So I'm removing a bit of the hinge itself, but leaving enough either side, so it still works as a hinge. And with the delicate bit done, I can set to drilling the holes, which I'm placing at regular intervals along the length of the slot, before trimming out the rectangle in exactly the same way as before, using a rocking motion with the sharp knife, squaring up the corners and gradually cutting out all the sides of the slot until I can remove the plastic in the middle, and then repeat the refine, test and refine process until we've got a slot big enough for our header to poke through, finishing up with a final trim. Now we've got all our internal gubbins in place, our plant watering monitor is starting to look the business, but we're missing something important, which is a way to hang it off the side of our pot. And for this, I'm repurposing one of those safety clips you get with a roller blind to keep the cords out of the way, just sawing off the bit where it folds back on itself to form a neat hook, which we'll need to attach to the back of our monitor. And for this, I'm using some plastic rivets, which I also got from Adafruit, but you should be able to get them from your hobby or art shop. And we're going to need to drill another hole in the back of the unit, so I need to remove the contents again. As the plastic is quite soft, I do this in two stages. Firstly, a smaller pilot hole, which can be enlarged with a bigger drill bit afterwards, which keeps everything neat, with only a little bit of tidying up with the scalpel afterwards. Then we can assemble our hook, pushing one side of the rivet through the hook and into the back of the box, where the other side can be just pressed on, no tools required. And even though it's only pushed on by hand, it makes a nice tight fit, allowing a little bit of rotation, but mostly our hook stays exactly where we want it. At the moment, the same can't be said for our internal components. But now, with all of our other bits in place, we can look for a more permanent solution, starting with the Adafruit charger, which I can simply bolt to the bottom of the box, drilling four small holes in the plastic that correspond to the ones on the charger. Now I say simply, but it turned out to be really fiddly. It was quite hard to get the holes in exactly the right place, and even harder to get the bolts through and the nuts screwed on and I had to shorten some of the bolts as well, as they were getting in the way of the battery. But eventually I prevailed, and the end result looks really neat. With the inside of the lid more accessible, doing the same thing for the Raspberry Pi Pico would presumably be much simpler. 
but it's a bit early for a permanent fixing, as I'm still refining the code and need to be able to access the USB port, so a sticky fixer will do for now. There's one more modification to the box, which I'll come to later, but for now, that's it finished. And I can plug in the USB-C cable to fully charge the battery, assisted by the solar panels, which are still crudely sellotaped to the window. Just how much current they provide remains to be seen, but even without the USB-C, my LEDs on the Adafruit charger, which I can see through the top of the box, are still illuminated, which shows I'm getting something. Now let's put it to the test, and I'm plugging in the sensor cable to the header. Now you may have noticed that throughout that last section, the program has been running all along, with the green LED flashing during the wake periods and going out in the deep sleep. Now let's see what happens with the sensor immersed in water. The Pico is currently in deep sleep, but as soon as it wakes, the red light on the sensor comes on, showing that it's getting power, but no green flashing light, so all is well. And the same is true when we try it out on our plant. The red light says the sensor's on, but no alert. Then, after a little period of deep sleep, it comes back on again, and the program runs, and we can see that our plant is happy and adequately watered. Before I get back to adjusting the programming, in order to change the duration of the deep sleep, there's one more modification I need to make. I can't simply plug the USB into the host computer, as that would power up the Pico, which is also connected to the battery. So I'm going to have to break that connection somewhere along the line. And rather than my original plan, which was just to unsolder the wires, I'm going to add a micro switch. And there's a convenient spot for that on the front of the unit. But I'll need to cut a little hole for it, using my normal method, which by now is becoming quite familiar. Fortunately, because of the position, I don't need to take the innards out of the box, and having drilled the four corner holes, I can slice out the edges with a scalpel. And as always, testing with the component, enlarging and refining as we go. Of course, all this could be done by a 3D printer, but I'm doing this at a fraction of the cost. And as I'm making it up slightly as I go along, I can make the modifications to the same box, rather than printing out a second or even a third prototype. Now I just need to solder the terminals, which will connect up my red wire when it's switched on, supplying battery power to the Pico. And in the off position, I can safely plug in the USB to the host computer for programming. And soldering done, I can push the switch through the hole, although I did have to switch the sides of one of the terminals. The fit of the switch is snug, but I will need to glue it into place, for which I'm using an epoxy glue, just squeezing out a small amount from each tube, mixing well, and then applying to the ends of the switch, where there's no risk of it gluing up the mechanism. And when it's dry, we can get on with the programming, disconnecting battery power with the flick of a switch before connecting the USB, which will then power up the Pico and start running the program, which we can open up and edit using Thonny in the usual way. If you remember back to the beginning, we shortened deep sleep to just a minute, but we can now restore it to the full 5 hours 59 minutes, or 21,540,000 milliseconds. I also want to try out a different threshold for my moisture settings, increasing the voltage under which the alert will be triggered, so the soil doesn't get quite as dry between waterings. The 6 hour delay between checks is also proving too long, so I'm just going to adjust that to a 59 minute period. So we'll get one check every hour. And our new power switch can also act as a reset, synchronizing our wake from deep sleep to the same time each hour. Another problem with the program as it stands is we only get one sensor reading. And if the alarm does go off, we don't know whether we've adequately watered our plant in response. So I want to use a similar loop instruction as we used down here. And after quite a lot of messing about and getting it wrong, I've added the loop instruction here between two lines of existing code and indented the subsequent lines so it applies to them. When the program launches again after deep sleep, it runs a sequence of six tests. If the soil is dry and the alarm is triggered, the LED will flash nine times and then pause for a second. Or else, if everything's okay, the program will sleep for 10 seconds before doing the next test. And here it is in action, the sensor's out of the water, and the voltage measured is a mere 16.1 millivolts, which you can see in the shell below the main program. But it's back in the water for the next one, and the voltage is shot up, so the program hasn't instigated the flashing LED, but the 10 seconds sleep instead. But by the time the next test comes round, I've removed the sensor from the water, so the voltage drops again, just below my threshold, which you may notice I've changed back to 500 and the next reading is well below that. So here's our code in full. We've got the imported modules from MicroPython at the top, 
followed by the LED and sensor definitions. Then what happens when it wakes from deep sleep? The sensor turns on and runs our six tests, triggering the alert if the voltage is too low, or else skipping to the next one. Then with that redundant green LED instruction removed, I can save and exit. For a novice like me, that was a bit of heavy duty coding. So for the next section, I'm gonna give myself a break and do something I'm a little bit more familiar with adding a little bit of pay to practicus branding using a water slide transfer that I've laser printed on some special paper. Now this is very much from the modeling side of my interests, but it's always nice to find a crossover. And if you're intrigued by the idea of doing something similar, of course I've got a how-to video, which you can find on the link above. With that final touch, the unit part of our monitor is looking really good. The same can't be said for our solar panels, which are currently a tangle of cables. And in this section, I'm going to sort those out, mounting them on a sheet of clear acrylic with a suction cup so they can stick to the inside of the window. The acrylics from my local art shop, the suction cups from Amazon. First thing is to unsolder all of those untidy joints from earlier. And I can also remove the wires from the back of the units, as I'll be directly soldering my barrel connector cable. But take care when you're doing this, otherwise like me, you may end up pulling off one of the terminals. But as always, it's important not to panic. And I realised hidden under the black paint, there's a copper strip leading round to the terminal at the end. And I can just scrape off a little bit of the paint, revealing the shiny copper below, to which I can add a blob of solder and heave a sigh of relief. My sheet of acrylic is two millimetres thick and covered with a protective film on either side, which is particularly handy for marking up positions of things. But I'm going to be using the grid on my cutting mat placing the solar panels where they're going to go, and then scoring the acrylic using a steel rule and my scalpel. Unlike glass, which you really should score only once, the acrylic is a bit more forgiving, and I've also cut through the protective film on the other side to ensure a clean snap. And for this, I've got my steel rule on its edge, directly underneath one side of the score, and with firm and even pressure, the acrylic gives way with a satisfying crack. Now I'm going to need some holes where the wires are going to come through. So I've got my solar panels face down on the cutting mat. And with everything lined up to the grid, I can mark out where the terminals are, making an allowance for the one I messed up. And on to drilling, with a bit of waste wood underneath. And for the harder acrylic, I'm not going for the pilot hole, just going for the single hit with quite a large drill bit, to allow space for my soldering. The heat of the drilling melts the plastic slightly, but I'm getting a nice clean cut but I do need to pick the drill bit clean between holes. Then with all four done, I can check the position of my panels and mark up for the suction cup, which will sit in the gap between the two, and then drill with an appropriately sized bit to match the threaded section of the cup. Then with all the drilling done, we can come to final assembly, and I'm peeling off the protective film from one side of the board, and once again aligning with the grid on the cutting mat. I'm putting four drops of superglue where the corners are going to be, and carefully placing the solar panel in place, aligning with the grid. And even though superglue dries pretty quick, I'm making sure it's properly set before flipping over the board for soldering. If you remember, the two panels are soldered in series, doubling the voltage of each one on its own. And I'm doing the same as before, but hopefully making a bit of a neater job. Just soldering the terminals through the holes, being careful not to melt the acrylic with the edge of the soldering iron. And when I'm done, I can remove the protective film, revealing the shiny transparent sheet, to which I just want to stick down my cable to stop it flapping around. The blobs of superglue showing through the transparent sheet are a little bit unsightly, and I think I'll use a different method if doing it again. But with the suction cup attached, I'm pretty pleased with the finished outcome. And all that remains is to find a suitable position where it can catch the most rays. And then plug the cable, which I've kept quite long, into the bottom of the monitor. And now for some rigorous testing. And I've realised that my usual method of waiting a couple of days to see if the battery runs out really won't cut the mustard. I've also worked out there's a side benefit to my on-off switch, enabling me to accurately measure the current using my digital multimeter. Starting with the switch in the off position, touching the terminals with the probes mimics turning it on, completing the circuit and launching our program. And here we can see the current draw when the sensor's operational. But holding everything in place for a minute shows us what happens when we go into deep sleep, which is a considerable drop, but still reading around about 15 milliamps. And even with the roughest of calculations, I can tell that that 100 milliamp max that I can expect from my two solar panels on the sunniest of days isn't going to be enough. So I've called in for some reinforcements in the shape of four more panels from Pi Moroni. 
from which I'm going to start by removing the cables, a little bit more carefully this time. I've also managed to scavenge my original pair, which broke away from the acrylic relatively easily, if a bit messily. And here's my plan. Six panels, wired in series pairs, and then paralleled with each other, tripling my current, all mounted on a similar piece of acrylic, with the same suction cups to hold it onto the window. But only so far so similar, and I want to make some real improvements on the previous version. The first being how it's attached to the acrylic sheet. And instead of superglue, I'm going for the double-sided sticky fixing pad. And instead of drilling holes for the wiring, I'm going to have that immediately behind the panels. And the thickness of the pads will give us the standoff we need, as well as holding the units together during assembly. But obviously as it stands, everything will be visible through the clear acrylic sheet. The wiring, the sticky fixing pads, and the damaged backs of my two original solar panels. But I've got a plan for that, which starts with marking a rectangle on the acrylic, the size of my six solar panels. Of course the lines are actually on the protective film, rather than the acrylic itself. And now I want to peel off the film from the other side of my sheet, where I'll be spraying a rectangle of white primer, exactly the size of my solar panels, which will hide all the unsightly gubbins. And as it's on the other side, the back will be the shiny clear acrylic. So with the protective film removed from this side, I can put down the masking tape following the lines from the other side. So no marks need to be made on the fresh surface of the acrylic at all. And with a final check of the size, I can go on and tape off all of the edges, making sure that everything that needs to be masked is sealed off before applying the paint. Of course the other side still has its protective film, so I don't need to worry about that. I'm using a pretty bog standard white primer, which I know will give me a good flat surface. The back of which, of course, will be the side that's showing through the clear acrylic. So I don't need to worry about glossiness. I just need something that's going to be tough and won't get scratched by the soldered wires during assembly. And that's what we come to now. For this, I'm using a fine brass wire, also from my local art shop, which I'm cutting to length and soldering to the end terminals of my solar panels. As I mentioned earlier, they'll be wired in series, in pairs, and then the three pairs wired in parallel together. And I'm starting by joining the positives of each pair, with a blob of solder on each terminal, and then the same with the three negatives. Now this is actually my second attempt, as first time round I managed to get my polarities all wrong, and instead of positive to negative in the serial bit of the circuit, I did negative to negative, ending up with two positives on the outside. So I had to take it all apart and reassemble in the right order. But now that's all done, I just need to bridge that narrow gap between adjacent terminals with a short piece of the brass wire to create my first series pair. And onto the second, using a little bit of masking tape to hold the wire in place while soldering. And with all three pairs of individual panels joined, I now need to get my maximum of 300 milliamps down to my water monitor, using the same cable with the barrel connector at the end, making sure I get the polarity right this time. The wire with the white line is my positive, and the one without the negative. And I just need to solder the stripped ends of each one to the appropriate parallel circuit connector, again using a little bit of masking tape to hold everything in place. And that's the circuitry finished, and I can go on to assembly, knowing that after all my soldering shenanigans, my white paint will now be thoroughly dry. The combination of the soldered wires and the sticky fixing pads is holding my six panels together, but only just, so now it's time to get it onto the perspex. And I'm taking my time to get it aligned to the white area, hovering over the surface until I'm sure it's straight, and only then making contact with the sticky fixers, and then pushing down firmly. Then I can peel back the protective film from the other side and put on the suction cups to complete my unit, ready to stick on the window and collect some solar energy to power my water monitor during the day as well as recharging the battery for the night time. And that brings my project to completion, one that has combined many skills, introduced unfamiliar products and developed my understanding of unfamiliar territories, of coding and electronics, as well as using some of my craft skills in a new and interesting way. And it's been about problem solving, and quite a bit of trial and error, and sometimes a complete rethink. But I've ended up with exactly what I wanted. A neat little unit, sustained by solar power alone, that will look out for my plants, conserving energy in deep sleep most of the time, waking every hour on the hour, to test the soil moisture level, and letting me know if a top up is required. And then back to sleep for the rest of the hour, just recharging the batteries, ready for next time.